Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm Dr. John McLean, and this will be uh, number eight in my series on uh, Providence. And uh, this evening, I will be discussing the question of the omnipresence of God. And we're looking at the attributes of God and how uh, they function uh, in relationship to the theological concept of the uh, sovereign providentiality of God. So uh, we believe that or present that uh, God is everywhere. He is omnipresent. He is all present. And I will take some uh, selective but uh, clearly a representative uh, statements from Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, that provide uh, enough support for us to affirm the omnipresence of God. Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. Now, God doesn't have eyes uh, in the sense of human eyes, but in uh, communicating uh, the attributes of God, anthropomorphisms or uh, representations of humanity are attributed uh, to the Lord. And it's emphasizing that he is everywhere. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. Uh, this could also be used of an affirmation of his omniscience. Uh, Psalms 139, the entire psalm, is uh, a good affirmation of God's omnipotence, his omnipresence, his omniscience, and so on and so forth. But the psalmist says, where can I go from your spirit? And I think uh, in the translation now, we can make that capital S, even though I don't believe that the Old Testament uh, saints would have understood this as the third person of the ontological trinity, uh, ever existent trinity that we uh, in the New Testament now understand as the Holy Spirit. But, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, uh, you know, at the speed of light, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, you know, five miles down or whatever, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. God is everywhere, and he has his hand upon the psalmist. Now, once again, uh, is what is said to the psalmist necessarily true of all of humanity? And that is a hermeneutical question. And I don't think that all of humanity can say, even your hand will lead me, and your right hand will lay hold of me, in the sense that if you're a non-believer, uh, you don't have the Holy Spirit indwelling you, and you uh, do not have uh, that leading of the Lord because you are currently in uh, rebellion against him. Now, Jeremiah 23, uh, 23 and 24, it says, Am I a God who is near, declares the Lord? And I would say absolutely, and not a God far off also. Can a man hide himself in hiding places so that I do not see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord, which is uh, his omnipresence uh, everywhere. And uh, we particularly see something like this in the uh, historical event of the life of 
uh, Jonah. First Kings 8, 27. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house which I built. And of course, it's the affirmation of Solomon. And uh, God is uh, uh, in the heavens. He's in the highest heavens. And yet he was able to also demonstrate his uh, presence uh, within the tabernacle and the temple. Matthew 18, 20, for where there are two or three gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst. And uh, speaking of the gathering of fellowship and prayer, and uh, God can be all places at all times as he fills all space. Acts 17, 24 through 27, the God, this is Paul speaking on um, Mars Hill. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. I would emphasize believers and non-believers. And he made from one man, Adam, every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Skipped up there. And the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. So God is omnipresent. He is available to everyone. He is about everyone. But uh, we need to, in that context, also understand that God has purposed appointed times. He has purposed boundaries. Now, has he appointed every second? What does it mean, appointed times? I believe that, that God has appointed a sovereign providential events in history. He has set the boundaries of the earth, the boundaries of nations, the boundaries of humanity. Uh, all of these uh, sovereign providential omnipresent things are designed to cause people to seek him. We have creation revealing God, conscience revealing God, and as it will be argued in Acts, the providence of God. The rain falls on the good and the evil, uh, uh, the bad, so on and so forth. So he is not far. Those who seek him will find him. So God is uh, omnipresent. Uh, in the book of Job, we have, it says, they spend their days in prosperity, talking about the rich, the ungodly rich, and suddenly they go down to Sheol. Now, Sheol here at the very least means death, the grave, and probably in this context also uh, the place of judgment. They say to God, and this is a very interesting passage. It's one of the few portals uh, that we have into the afterlife and judgment. A, a second one in the New Testament would be the story of the rich man and uh, Lazarus. But uh, they say to God, these uh, who have gone down to Sheol, to the grave, to death, to a place of judgment, they say to God, depart from us. We do not even desire the knowledge of your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what would we gain if we entreated him, if we asked him? Conclusion, behold, their prosperity is not in their hand, 
The counsel of the wicked is far from me, Job says. Uh, even in judgment, even in Sheol, the unbeliever is going to say, I want nothing to do with you, God, personally. I don't want to know about you, and I don't want to be around you. So, there are many other passages that affirm the on the presence of God, but here are some questions for us to think about. In what ways is God present, you know, present everywhere? Uh, can God choose not to be present somewhere? Can God choose not to be present in hell? Uh, we have, you know, the, the question, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, was there a separation of presence uh, at the cross? Uh, will God be present in hell? Is God present in the current place of judgment? In what ways is God present with the believer? In what way ways is God present with the non-believer? If God is present everywhere, does it mean he is active in all situations? If God is there in the good, we like that. We acknowledge he's there. But if something evil happens, one of the first questions we ask is, God, where were you? Why didn't you do something? Many times people don't believe in the sovereignty of God until something goes wrong, and then they want to blame him for not being present. Can God be present at evil situations and do nothing? Why is it necessary for God to be present or all present everywhere to be God? Is that a necessary required attribute of God? Well, uh, you can think about these questions. And in the next section uh, or the next presentation, I will take some time and provide uh, my understanding of these questions.